Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast, episode number 506, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, the characterizations of inflammation in modern medicine. BioBalance Health features conversations about anti-aging medicine. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health, and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about testosterone replacement therapy for women, and Got Testosterone, the newly released book for men, that helps men choose the most effective and safe form of T replacement. These books are available on Amazon or from Dr. Moffin's office at BioBalance Health in St. Louis and in Kansas City. Dr. Moffin's office is currently accepting new patients. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde is a famous old story about this physician in London who was experimenting with some chemicals and taking them, and as a result of that, had personality changes into a, an evil, violent man. And there were two characters, Dr. Jekyll, who was a good guy, and everybody loved him and respected him, and Mr. Hyde, who was wicked and evil. We chose that analogy, that comparison, to enable us to talk about inflammation this week. Inflammation, chronic versus acute mm-hmm. inflammation, what we're going to be talking about today. Because acute inflammatory episodes are actually beneficial because, it, like pain, they tell you something is wrong. They tell you where it's wrong, and, and you have an opportunity to do something to correct it mm-hmm. and solve the problem. If you don't correct it and you don't solve the problem, then the pain becomes chronic or the inflammation becomes chronic and can do a lot of damage to your body and your lifestyle over time. So we want to talk through what we know about both the good and the bad parts of inflammation this week. I think it's important to, to define acute and chronic. Because yes. If you're not in medicine, then those aren't words you use every day. No, no. And you used to laugh because they'd say, oh, you have an acute pain. I said, yeah, I do, thanks. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. Yeah. yeah uh-huh. uh, uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I used to be ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, acute means short-term, uh, severe usually, and it has a natural end to it. When When the job is done, it stops. But chronic means... It goes, this is a situation that goes on and on and on, and it's hard to get it to stop, and it doesn't have an end point. So chronic is long-term, acute is short-term, and so that's kind of the the difference between the two kinds of inflammation. The good inflammation is is acute and short-term, the bad inflammation is long-term, and it doesn't have an end. So an acute pain would be like if you step on a thumbtack. That's pain. Yeah, that mm-hmm. sharp, quick pain, and mm-hmm. it heals pretty quickly, a few mm-hmm. days, and it doesn't bother you when you walk mm-hmm. anymore. But a chronic pain would be like a backache from an old car injury or something, uh, accident, that just stayed with you for years and years, and you always had pain. Or it's, or it's knees. Or your like knees. A lot your of knees, knees and hips. When my, my most unfavorite thing to try to explain to people is they, I get a guy in, and he says, yeah, I've got... I've got had knee pain for five years, and I haven't had it fixed yet. Like, that's a good thing. And then I have to explain to him, you know, being brave and not getting something fixed right. has caused this, this particular patient to undergo inflammation throughout his body, which means inflammation is, is damaging when it's long-term, and it's damaging to his knee as well. So he's had pain because he's had chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation has lots of negative side effects within the body, like, for example, it causes uh, atherosclerosis or or a collection of fat on the inside of your blood vessels just from being inflamed, not because you have high cholesterol, just because you, you have inflammation. It causes you to have goo stuck on the inside of your blood vessels. So let's talk about what that is. I mean, if, if I have an inflamed knee. Say I've wrenched or twisted my knee. I've fallen, gone down the steps let's or something. Let's do something. Let's say you've worn your knees out. Okay. And there is something like we joggers. Can, it's not going to stop. It's not going to. It's not going to stop on its own. Yeah. Like a twisted knee or a twisted leg. We'll eventually or, get that'll better. eventually get better. Okay. But if you have jogged yourself into losing the cartilage on the two yeah. bones that come together and usually protect the bones. Uh huh. If you've lost that and you need a new knee, then that's really what we're talking about. 
So, so the pain that I get from that is a signal from my knee to the rest of my body mm-hmm. saying, help, I'm in trouble. Right. And your body then sends little chemical messengers everywhere throughout your body to collect this information. Oh, mm-hmm. this is a problem, this is a problem. And they bring mm-hmm. it back to the right. central control center. Mm-hmm. And it says, okay, we need to send white blood cells. Like if, if you get a cut or something, mm-hmm. it, they find it. And they send white corpuscles to it, and that's mm-hmm. what fights the infection and, and helps you heal. And sometimes it makes prostaglandins, which makes it hurt. Yeah. So, so if you do it on a short-term basis, say, you know, you've just had this, you've hit, you've hit the wall, you now are bone on bone, you now need to have something done, you have bad pain because the white cells come to that area and secrete prostaglandins and that causes the pain, a pain reaction, a liquid pain reaction. Mm -hmm. And it irritates that area, but it also goes to your whole body. So not, it's not just in your knee. It's everywhere. Once you get released into the bloodstream, they circulate through the whole body. They don't just go to that location and stay. And they damage, if it's long-term, they damage your vessels. They can damage your liver. They can damage your nerves. I mean, this is something that is it, it it's the center of aging and the when we're aging we aren't anabolic we're not growing we're catabolic we're breaking down so it increases the breakdown of muscle and bone and cartilage it makes it worse so this is something that inflammation normally would come in and fix something but if you have so much damage you can't fix it it just goes on until you do something about it so how do doctors identify that it's not like you can uh, give me an MRI and say, well, your chest is inflamed. Uh, they do MRIs of the knee, and they can see that um, there's a lot of fluid. In, so, so when you have an inflammation, usually fluid, you swell. Swell, okay. redness, heat, uh, and pain. Those are the signs of inflammation. Okay. So they can see the fluid that's extra fluid on, on uh, MRI, but they, it, within the knee uh, joint, but they also see that there's no cartilage there. Okay. So they see what caused this is you've run so much that your cartilage is gone and now you're bone on bone and, and that's causing the inflammation. There's nothing to do about that except either have surgery and get a new knee or for a while they can put, um, they can put synvisc okay. inside, the, inside the joint uh-huh. to actually give you some fluid so that it doesn't rub so so um, without so, lubrication, it's yeah, a brittle the, bone against brittle right. bone. Right, and so yeah. the inflammatory fluid doesn't help it. It's not viscous. It's not slippery. Yeah. But synvisc is just like the fluid that's in your knee normally, and it will help kind of smooth things over so you're not grinding on your knee. Synvisc is that a contraction for synthetic viscosity? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, so you can do that for a while, but then it doesn't work anymore, and then you absolutely have to have the knee, have the knee redone. So that's my best example because that's the thing I, I find men think they're being really brave not getting the new knee, but, you know, Well, but men, it's men not and helping. boys in our culture are trained to try to minimize and ignore pain. Mm-hmm. You got to suck it up. You got to be tough. Mm-hmm. Be a man. I mean, we're, we're raised with those messages from well, so childhood. So are doctors, whether they're male or female. So we were. You were told to suck we were, it up and be yeah. tough and ignore your own pain, right. your own stamina so issues. If you're operating and yeah. you know something happens and <laughs> time for a cigarette break. You're in te- no, yeah. and you're in terrible pain for some reason. Yeah. You ignore that. You have to put it aside because you have to concentrate on what you're doing. Nothing can bother you while right. you're doing that, or delivering a baby. Nothing can bother you while you're doing that. Well, That's yeah. the most important thing. So your own pain, you end up losing that ability to know if you're in pain or not. I'm not talking about psychological right. pain. I'm talking about No, it's like pain. dissociative. You, you have to learn how to compartmentalize and separate mm-hmm. out from those stimulus signals that your body receives. Mm-hmm to not give them priority recognition. Normally, mm-hmm. we have priority recognition for our pain signals, mm-hmm. but you can learn to increase your tolerance for that mm-hmm. and separate out. There's a famous story about uh, the Watergate burglar, G. Gordon Liddy, mm-hmm. was afraid of rats and made himself go on in the, in the bowels of a commercial ship in the harbor mm. and locked <laughs> himself in for a week, knowing that there were rats all around, to quiet down his desensitize terror. Desensitize him. Yeah, to desensitize him from mm-hmm. it. He also did the same thing with pain 
with a, a burning candle flame on the palm of his hand. He would hold his hand until it burned black. He wouldn't pull it away. And anybody else would jerk away from, mm-hmm. from the heat. But he learned to tolerate that. That's an extreme. Mm-hmm. But what it tells us is that people can, can learn to ignore that. pains. And in general, we make boys do that more than girls. Like, yes. Get up and put a Band-Aid on it. It's okay. Who cares? Well, yeah. You know, it's you know, suck it up. Don't be a crybaby. Yeah, you get a little little toddler coming in, four year old child, mm-hmm. three year old child, skinned his knee. Mm-hmm. My dad would look at me and say, "Suck it up, boy. Go out and play. I don't have time for that." A little girl comes in with a skinned knee. My dad would pick her up and hug her and say, "Oh, poor baby, and let's fix that." Well, I was there an only child, so I was messages. the boy and the girl. So they told me to suck it up. So you got mixed <laughs> messages, is what you're telling <laughs> I, me. I basically got <laughs> yeah. suck it up, and you know. <laughs> yeah. That's that's and that was good training for being a doctor. So in any case, your body so the inflammatory process is like this. All of a sudden something you you either are traumatized, you have an injury, or you have an infection. So now with this with COVID nineteen, we can kind of see what COVID nineteen does. It causes you to have an infection, which then releases all of these inflammatory cells. And the inflammatory cells are meant to kill the virus, right? So the inflammatory cells are released from from your thymus, uh, from the, your bloodstream. It goes to the area that is is sickest, like the lungs. So with COVID, it's the lungs. And these cells then release inflammatory liquid, which then kills the virus. It does it for cancer cells. It does it for bacteria. Sometimes it's not successful. Sometimes your inflammatory system isn't good enough. Right. You don't have enough white cells. As we age, we don't we get fewer white cells, or we don't have a good immune response. So, or we're on medicine that decreases our immune response, with like steroids or uh, autoimmune drugs. They decrease our ability statins? to have no, oh, not statins, not statins, but autoimmune medication. Okay, you know, like rheumatoid arthritis medication. Right, those things that suppress your immune system. So those, those kind of medicines can actually make you not respond normally or with enough inflammation to actually kill the virus or the bacteria. So that's when it, it gets out of hand. Okay. That's when the inflammation is good. We want it to go there, and we want to kill the bacteria when or the virus. When it's acute. When it's acute. When it's, it's chronic and just goes on term. and on and on, right, so. then that's not a helpful thing because you build that stuff up in your body. Mm-hmm. And then it spreads to the rest of your body. It gets inside your arteries and your mm-hmm. blood vessels and build up. It goes the plaque. everywhere. Yeah. And in a, like Alzheimer's is secondary to an inflammation in your brain that has been there a long time. So some people are susceptible to it genetically. Some people have more um, inflammation because maybe they have rheumatoid arthritis that's not being treated. Right. So they have too much inflammation in their body and it goes to their brain and damages it. So, so you listed uh, in our study notes here examples of inflammation that people might recognize. If we're talking right. about as you age, inflammation becomes more important to identify because your body responds to it differently and less well. And mm-hmm. so the, to have a, a chronic inflammation is problematic. So mm-hmm. you need to identify acute uh, inflammatory triggers mm-hmm. and get them treated. And examples of those acute inflammatory triggers are acute bronchitis. So you get your bronchial areas are swollen and you have mm-hmm. trouble breathing and it's painful. It's uh, usually after a bacteria or a virus has been killed, you still have inflammation in your bronchial tubes. And you still are coughing long after that virus or bacteria is gone. Right. Uh, a lot of people have uh, ingrown toenails, infected toenails, and you get all that swollen skin around there and the pus and stuff that comes out of them. Mm-hmm. It's really ugly and stinky, and mm-hmm. but it's a sign of an acute inflammatory trigger mm-hmm. that, if you take care of it reasonably, will go away in a couple of weeks. Uh, it'll heal, and the problem is gone until you get another ingrown toenail or you do some but other— But if you don't— if you don't deal if with it. If you don't deal with it or... Or if you can't because you you're can't. compromised. Right. Uh, like, like my father had uh, his right foot cut off because he had diabetes and, and neuropathy and couldn't... My get, grandfather had his leg cut off because of that. Yeah, he, he couldn't get blood infection. flow in his, in his skin to, to circulate the healing uh, prostaglandins. Process. Yeah, the prostaglandins have to go in there and, and, and he break couldn't do it. So they had to cut his foot off. He got gangrene. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't have good blood flow 
you're not going to get the cells to the area that it needs to go and when to. you go to your annual physical your doctor will check that they'll look at your feet and they'll feel them and they'll look <laughs> to see if you are getting mm -hmm. sensation everywhere and they look to see if there's any mm -hmm. swelling in your ankles I mean, they check all that out because that's what they're looking for inflammation which is a signal that it's a chronic problem as opposed to an acute problem right especially with diabetes that's important yeah so they're always looking for that with your blood work or, or with the physical exam yeah so a sore throat related to the flu, right. so you're sore because your th throat is inflamed in response to a bacterial or viral infection. Right. So it, it becomes pain, heat, redness, you have swelling, um, and sometimes loss of function. You can't swallow. So, so that's, that's an so, inflammatory. So then we always come back to the question about uh, antibiotics. They don't mm -hmm. want to give you an antibiotic for a virus, a virus. Mm -hmm. because it doesn't, doesn't have an work. impact on it mm -hmm. at all. But right. a lot of us, last week we did a podcast where we talked about magical thinking. We mm -hmm. believe that there's a magical pill. If we take the magical pill, even if it's a placebo, mm -hmm. our body will start trying to do something with it because our mind works that way. But antibiotics don't work on viral infections. That's right. Uh, and so they'll say, well, do you have a viral infection? And you say, well, I don't know. And then they'll say, well, what color is your snot? You know, do I That's look at I that? That's what I say. Yeah, I know. Yellow doctors, or green. Doctors do, yeah. Or clear. If it's clear then in general, it's not, it's not bacterial. If it's yellow or green, it can be bacterial. But the best way to know if you've got a bacteria or a virus is a blood test. And because we can't really culture viruses. They're hard to culture right. and, and like do a swab and tell you what you have. So we, we do a blood test, and in a day or less than a day, we can find out if you have a lot of poly... <laughs> It's, I mean, this is hard to explain. You have neutrophils. If you have a lot of neutrophils and not very many lymphocytes in your blood count, then it's bacterial. If you have a lot of lymphocytes and monocytes and not very many uh, neutrophils, then it's viral. So you can tell. So in the movie or in the TV show House, they're always yeah. trying to, they're always confused. Is it viral or is it, or is it bacterial? Well, it's easy. The cheapest test is like eight bucks, a CBC with a differential will tell you what you're sick from. A CBC is some kind of blood test, right? Yeah, it's a it's a blood it has white count, red count, you know, the oxygen carrying capacity, okay. your immune system, and then it tells you how many of each white cell you have. Right. And so if you have a lot more of the white cells that respond to viruses and it's a high number, then you're infected with the virus. So your body calls forth what it needs. Right. So it, it does. It, it, it has the ability to distinguish between them and send the correct white blood cells. Right. And then okay. we can see it because in your blood, these armies of, of uh, monocytes and lymphocytes are going to that area, but it's all throughout your body. You can, you can test the blood and see what's running around your body and tell what you're infected with. So the bacteria is, is a different, they call it a left shift or a right shift. Okay. That doesn't really mean much to anybody who's not a doctor, but it's it's more of one cell than the other. So you have uh, cuts, scratches, burns mm -hmm. on your skin. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember I was junior high school. I was riding my bicycle somewhere. I hit a pothole, sailed over the handlebars, oh. landed on the street face down. You have a traumatic childhood. <laughs> I was a slow learner. <laughs> but I, I was like my entire chest was skinned. A road burn, rug burn, mm -hmm. whatever you want to call it, and it had scabs all over mm -hmm. it and oozed for days. Uh, that's looking inflammation. at it, okay, that, that's, <laughs> that's inflammation. All yeah. that ooze is serum containing white cells that are coming to to break down the dead tissue, carry it away, and then you start growing new tissue, right. which is a healthy tissue. Okay, so the inflammation's breaking it all down all right. and cleaning it up. So you can. You can tell that just from looking at it. You don't have to do yeah. a blood test for that. Not for that. But for infections, we often have to do blood tests to see what we're dealing with. Is it a virus that does not need an antibiotic because antibiotics are for uh, bacteria? Or is it bacteria that we can give an antibiotic to? So you say inflammation after any surgery. That, that always stuns me because... If you do a surgery in a hospital where it's mm -hmm. a sterile environment and they, they precisely cut and they stitch you up and all that stuff, why would you have inflammation after a surgery? A because surgery your body has a wound, means, a violation. Yeah, we've, and, we've, cut, we've cut you. Yeah. We've cut a, a person. We've actually 
um, induce the trauma. And so for you to heal, so whatever you need I was traumatized all those for that I needed cells. the surgery, the surgery itself is traumatic. Right. Additionally. It yeah. And it's it's inflammatory. Yeah. But it's limited inflama- inflammation. It goes on just a short period of time and then you're healed. You know, six weeks later, all that inflammation goes away. Okay. So that's all the good I- inflammation. So you you say in your notes, inflammation over time will break down tissue. So continuing to live with an inflamed joint is the dumbest one of the dumbest things <laughs> that someone can do because mm-hmm. it causes accelerated damage to the joint and the inflammatory chemicals that are generated cause plaque to build up in your arteries, which leads to heart problems. Right. And heart failure. And, right. And I mean, you can have somebody who has um, plaque in their blood vessels when we do the cardiac calcium scan. They have plaque. And... Their cholesterol is fine, and I mean, there's no real good reason for them to have plaque except that they've had some inflammatory process that they didn't fix, they didn't take care of. And I, we didn't mention this, but some sometimes if, some, if we have an acute episode and we have inflammation, then the inflammation, we can see that it's continuing. Mm-hmm. We look at a, a test called the CRP. If it's still up, then we can give a course of prednisone or steroids, that decreases inflammation. So we for a short period of time, it's not a long period of time, but short period of time. Does it interfere with your body's signaling process so they yeah. don't send the white blood cells? Yeah. It okay. decreases the white blood cell response. Yeah. So you don't overreact right. to to an infection or a trauma. Well we talked about the how to distinguish between chronic and acute inflammation is one more little list of, of items that we want to show you mm-hmm. of chronic inflammation as opposed to acute the, the enduring long-lasting damaging kind of inflammation you will recognize it from these symptoms that you will be experiencing excessive fatigue constant fever mouth sores rashes abdominal pain chest pain and these can last months or years people have them and don't get them treated don't get the problem resolved and as you age it is a more serious problem so if you make the distinction or the determination that you think you are suffering from chronic pain as opposed to acute pain, go and discuss it with your physician. Let them check you out because to ignore it can lead to an early and painful death. Thank That's you for right. listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.